welcome everybody to the panel that is entitled Fatherhood Through COVID and Racial Strife. Uh, my name is Roberto Rivera. I'll be sharing a little bit more of who I am, my background is, but I am very excited and very honored today to so have some amazing distinguished guests. Uh, so you're gonna be hearing from Tony, from David, from Anthony in just a moment, but I wanna provide a little bit of context for this time together. And that is, we are living in a historic moment right now, a time of unprecedented trauma. Uh, I looked it up today and it said that as of today, 563,475 people have died from COVID-19. Uh, we've known that racial inequity has been real for a long time. And a lot of these realities have been exposed through this pandemic, through the disproportionate impact on communities of color. Uh, we've seen, for example, that black folks make up 13% of the population, yet 33% of folks who've contracted the virus and 34% of folks who have died. The Latinx community, we are 84% of the essential workforce. And that we have subsequently been catching the virus five times the rate of our white counterparts. Our brothers and sisters in the Navajo Nation have been the hardest hit community in the entire country. And they've been getting the virus more than any other community per capita. Um, and if this was not enough, we are also seeing that this veil of racial oppression is alive and well through the senseless murder of people like Dwayne Wright, George Floyd, who's a father of five, Stephen Clark, who was a father of two, Rashard Brooks, father of four, Jacob Blake, who was not murdered, but became paralyzed in Wisconsin and is a father of six, and countless others. But we are not here today to come with the message of hope, of pain. We're not here to come with the message of despair, but a message of hope and of what is possible. And I just want to quickly share this idea of post-traumatic growth. I'm sure many of you have heard of resilience, and this concept is similar. Resilience and, and post-traumatic growth both deal with the setback. But resilience is about coming back to baseline. Post-traumatic growth is the phenomenon by which people grow from the pain, that they experience a sense of empowerment, clarity of purpose, and enhanced interpersonal relationships. And so although today our topic and our theme is fatherhood, I believe that this topic and this conversation will be a vehicle that could potentially stimulate post-traumatic growth in our families, our communities, our state, and possibly even our nation. So as we transition to my welcoming this distinguished uh, panel of, of leaders in Wisconsin, uh, I just want to have you all introduce yourself, your name, the title of your organization. Tell us the names and ages of your babies. I'll go ahead and get us started. I'm Tony Garcia. Interim Associate Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Edgewood College in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I have a two-year-old named Sienna that I'm going to go uh, tend to right now. She's just waking up from nap. So I will be right back as soon as she gets situated for the afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for modeling being a good dad. I'll go ahead and jump in there. Um, yeah, man, it is phenomenal. But, um, but yeah, so also I am Anthony Cooper. I'm the CEO of the Focus Interruption um, in, in Madison. I'm also Vice President of Reentry Services and Strategic Partnerships for Nehemiah Center for Urban Leadership. Um, I have a 22 and 23-year-old, two boys. Um, yeah, that who I'm very proud of. Um, so, yeah, so... And my name is David Aguayo. I am the public policy manager for the Greater Madison Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I have one sweet baby girl who just turned four months today. Her name is Madison Celeste Aguayo. 
Um, and you might be hearing her crying in the background. All right. Thank you so much. And again, I'm your moderator, Roberto Rivera. I am the executive director of a non-for-profit called the Pain to Propane Project, an international non-for-profit helping to create thriving educational ecosystems. And I'm coming to you all live from Montreal, Canada, where it is a balmy 53 degrees. So quick uh, heads up, we do have the chat open. So if you feel compelled to react or offer up a, a question, we will try to get to that in the Q&A. And we are going to just jump right in. So the first question, gentlemen, is how, if at all, has your relationship with your father influenced how you parent your children? And do you have a philosophy that helps guide the way that you father? Uh, for me, um, I would say definitely it impacted my father. Um, I mean, he just he wasn't there, you know. So it's one of those things that where I think I didn't really have much to model off of, but I knew I needed to be everything that he wasn't. Right, you know. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but to be able to, you know, um, continue to not only show up and and have the conversations, be open to the things that, um, you know, always, at, well, from from birth, but then also, you know, as now that they're men, um, you know, being able to make sure that we continue to have the conversation, you know. So I just want to set a different bar than what um, than what I had from my own father. So. Um, yeah, that's just, yeah, yeah. that was just really, that was, has always been my goal and continues to be my goal. Even now that I've met my father and we have a good relationship. Uh, but at the same time, these are some of the things that what we talk about now, it, um, you know, some of the things that he wished that he would have did different and, and so on and so forth. And so, and we talk about that as a, as a family, right. You know, the men of the family, my sons, and also in the expectation what it is to be a father later on down the road for them as well. Beautiful, thank you, Koo. I'll uh, pick up um, since Tony is tending to his daughter, but um, you know, the relationship that I had with my father, which, okay, make sure I wasn't muted. Um, the relationship I had with my father was, um, you know, we, we had a really great relationship. He was, uh, there for me, he provided, he always uh, ensured that I had what I wanted. You know, that wasn't, to, that doesn't go to say that we came from a wealthy family or anything like that. My father was an immigrant from Ecuador who worked his entire life to be able to provide uh, for his family. So for that, I'm grateful. And in that it, uh, influenced me on, you know, how I father. Um, I, I I see his working, his work ethic in myself. I. Yeah, I love my baby, as I just mentioned, just turned four months today. And I, I, I think I overwork myself and I just, you know, want to make sure that I, I, I'm there and I, but the, she has everything that she needs and I'm able to provide uh, not only for her, but for my wife as well. Um, and, you know, that to that point, uh, it, you know, what I have seen from my father, but also you know, the things that I don't agree with um, and, and, you know, what could be considered toxic max masculinity. And uh, for time's sake, I won't get into the weeds in the background and, you know, of every detail. And um, it's not necessarily coming from my father, but definitely from within the family, my grandfather, my uncles, uh, you know, they would use phrases like don't cry, men don't cry, uh, toughen up, you got to be a man. Uh, these are words that I believe really do hinder emotional development. Um, you know, it's normal to cry. It's normal to show emotion. Um, and while I don't have a son now, I will definitely let them know that this, you know, it's normal to show your emotions. It's normal to cry. Um, these are normal things that we experience as humans. Uh, and I think, you know, just the overall philosophy is, is just continue to show love, uh, continue to uh, grow. And, uh, you know, from my family and what they've taught me to put God first in everything that we do. Beautiful. Tony, how is your relationship with your dad influence how you father? Do you got a philosophy that helps kind of guide you? Appreciate the question and um, what Anthony and David had to share as well. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have my father uh, very involved in my life uh, during the last 35 years of my existence, from rearing to sports um, to, you know, fathering to this day. 
Uh, and over the years, my relationship with my own dad, you know, has evolved to a friendship partner, someone that, you know, I consider wise counsel for myself um, when it comes to being both a man and a father. And growing up, my dad and I did not always see eye to eye uh, on a lot of different things, but I knew he loved me and wanted me to be the best person I possibly could become. Um, he's always had my back and has challenged me to just be a better person. Uh, from a parenting standpoint, I've learned a lot of great things from my dad and similar to what David was just mentioning, a lot of parenting strategies and things I do not intend to replicate either. Um, I currently live right down the street from my folks. I visit with them regularly, you know, live with them during the pandemic in their house for much of 2020. And it was honestly refreshing to see him as a grandfather. Uh, and, you know, during that year, I saw a different side of my dad, a side that I wish uh, when I was a kid, I would have saw. And it reshaped my own thinking and thoughts on, on fatherhood. Uh, my dad's a, a really important part of my life and I always will be. When I think about my own philosophy on being a parent, uh, I'm a divorced dad to a two-year-old, uh, two years, four months. Um, and, you know, I've been wrestling with that question. And uh, I don't think I have a philosophy. It's just following my gut and truly embracing the time I have with my daughter. Uh, I've shared custody with my daughter in 50-50 placement. So time matters to me. Uh, I think expressing love, cherishing time, and having a lot of patience is what will guide me as I continue to be a better man and a father. Wonderful. And thank you guys for being open and honest. Uh, again, you know, for me, uh, I am the father of three boys, uh, Phoenix, uh, who's nine, Justice, who's four, and Lorenzo, who is four months as of Sunday. So we got a couple four month old kids in the mix here. Uh, but yeah, for me, I guess my philosophy and my relationship with my dad um, can really kind of be summed up in in, in a quick sort of story and metaphor, uh, I have a good friend in Madison, Wisconsin, named Greg Doby, and he is a, a great dad of four. Um, also happens to be a music producer, and so he's created different beats, and some of the beats have sold millions of records. Um, so one of the songs that he created was for a group called G Unit, and it sold over a million copies. And he, in the particular song that he created sampled from a Nina Simone record. And so Nina Simone's people, one day they heard the song and they came, they came after him and they said, hey, uh, you know, we need to get a piece of this royalty. And so then he kind of schooled me on this idea of what he calls reverse sampling, which is he'll find a sample in the record, but instead of just taking it and dropping in that into the mix, he'll play the sample backwards. So if it's a piano melody or a trumpet, uh, he says it oftentimes still sounds good if it's done really well uh, on the recording. And I realized that that was my metaphor for how to be a, a good father. You know, my, my dad was an alcoholic growing up, uh, was very abusive to myself and my mom. Um, eventually, he became a workaholic, gave up the alcohol. Uh, then he was gone all the time, He'd be gone six months at a time. And and Nicaragua, Latin America, when he came back, uh, he was never fully present. Um, I never saw my dad cry, hardly ever saw him cook. My mom swears that she can't remember if he ever changed a single diaper. So for me, I'm reverse sampling my dad's example, similar to what you're saying, Tony and, and David and others and Coop, you know, uh, trying to take the good things, but a lot of, unfortunately, is, is the reverse. So I'm trying to be hyper present for my boys. I want them seeing me not just come into the games, come into the practice. I want to be like, dad, why you got to come to everything, you know? And so, uh, you know, and also trying to be emotionally available. My, my boys have seen me cry, you know, and, you know, Lord knows I've, I've changed a lot of diapers, <laughs> especially in the last four months. And so just trying to live and, and model this thing differently. So gentlemen, if we kind of lean into this metaphor of a hip hop producer, you know, who draws inspiration from a variety of sources of music to make a new song. Who or what do you sample from in the creation of your particular mix of being a father? You know like what? To start? 
I, I kind of like how you put that together and how you kind of, you know, this little spin of, you know, <laughs> I, I almost feel like I, I needed two turntables on the side of me and just started blending some stuff in. Right. Yes. Um, so, oh, man, that's that's uh, I think that's for me personally, that's a, it's, it's deep. Right. So um, I because I didn't grow up with my father, there were people in the community that who I grabbed stuff from, right? You know, there were people that were television shows, you know, I mean, some people may hate it or whatever. Bill Cosby, that was a part of my father. Let's see, you know what I mean? Kind of saying like, oh, wow, that's what a father is supposed to be like, you know, uh, uh, with the Cosby show, right? Um, how how he would raise his kids, be sarcastic, but also teaching lessons at the same time, which my son's they like and dislike sometimes that's a whole nother story but um but also i think that where there are individuals in in, in the community um like my i have had, had a godfather Ooh, come here. sorry about that you all um uh my godfather who also uh um his name is um, berlin turner um his past now it's been two years but um was really i i saw how you know how he loved on his family right i saw how he he also you know i mean through everything you know um how he kind of navigated life and then also my uncle um my uncle was the one that who was like my father right that would punish me put me in a headlock you know and you know yeah <laughs> yeah tear me up if <laughs> it came down to it but but i think kind of gave me some of the the principles that where if he was living i think that where i feel like he would be proud of the fact of how I am with my sons, knowing that that's how he was with me as, you know, even though he lived in New York and I live here in Madison, Wisconsin. So, which is, I was blessed to have him in my life. I can um, jump in and, and kind of, you know, my, I believe sample uh, comes from a variety of sources. Uh, in my upbringing, I was very heavily involved in the church, which, you know, involved family, um, other mentors like my pastors. Um, and then just growing up, what added to my worldview or, you know, friends, academia, politics. Um, so I believe all of these just really play a, a big role in, in how I view, you know, being a father or how I want to be a father. Um, you know, it, it had a bunch of positive influences from, from my family, from the different families within the church. It was a very tight knit community of, of, as I mentioned earlier, my, my father was an immigrant from Ecuador. So we just had a tight knit community of other immigrants and had a, a lot of shared values, a lot of shared uh, ideals and morals. And just having those people to fall back on, you know, if it wasn't my dad that I wanted to talk to, it was those folks who I could, I could lean on. So definitely uh, just taking all of those and, and, you know, shaping my worldview is definitely not doing everything the same way that my parents did. Um, you know, just growing up, getting the education, leaving Wisconsin, coming back to Wisconsin, all led to me having a, a different worldview than my parents and, and help guide me in making my own decisions uh, for my family. And, you know, another uh, fountain that I, I believe that I draw inspiration from is, is and most formidably is my wife. Uh, we've been high school, hearts, we've been together for so long. Um, and through our, our relationship, we've worked together in, in building the future that we want. And uh, we've come a long way. Uh, and together, you know, moving forward and what we want to become and what we want to have, uh, it's just having open dialogue, open conversations and 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 how we can use our shared values and ideals and and how that shapes me as a father you know what we expect in the future of ourselves and our family and then that helps shape me and, and how i'm going to you know raise my family so it, it's just really a, a conglomerate of of different fountains and and different sources that have helped lead me to who i am today and i think that's a not a bad thing i think it's a great thing it's a beautiful thing. Thank you for sharing, David. And I've touched on, you know, one source of inspiration already, my, my dad, um, similar to, you know, what David and, and Anthony have echoed. Um, but also importantly, when I think about inspiration is my two sisters and mother. Uh, both of my sisters also have two-year-olds, um, and they're really important people in my life. Uh, I've learned a lot from them about what it means to be a father, a parent. Um, my mom is at the center and maybe off-center now of my heart. 
uh, with you know Sienna being at the core and center. Um, she's left such a great impression on me. My mom has uh, not only as a person, as a man, as a dad, as a leader. She's shaped me and my character. Um, so family is, is for me first and foremost where I draw inspiration from. Um, I've also been blessed with some lifelong friends, similar to what David was talking about, and had the privilege of having some real ass conversations with folks um, who already have kids. Um, and while my ex-wife was pregnant, um, you know, we found out we were having a girl. And, you know, I, one of the good buddies of mine, Derek Johnson, um, him and I were having a conversation about uh, some of the stereotypical stuff that you see men doing, you know, on movies or whatnot, playing with Barbies and tea parties. And I was like, is that a real thing? Uh, he's like, yep, uh, good luck. And, you know, we had just real in-depth conversation about what it meant to be a dad and embrace, uh, you know, um, living through the mind and through the lens of your kids and of your daughter. And so, you know, I think that's been a big inspiration of mine. I've taken that, that advice to heart um, and I'm thoroughly enjoying living my life uh, through the eyes of a two-year-old, through the eyes of my daughter. Um, you know, her nickname is Cece. Um, she was having a hard time for saying Sienna. And so it became Cece. And, you know, in Spanish, C is yes. Um, and so I joke, you know, here that when I uh, call her Cece, it's because pretty much everything she's saying or wanting to do, it's yes for me. Um, I say, yes, yes, sure, whatever, let's do it. Um, and I realized that, you know, shortly down the road, CC's going to become no-no. Uh, but right now, I'm thoroughly enjoying uh, living, you know, life through her eyes and through her lens and being present and engaged with her. Um, and she is, you know, the source of my inspiration right now, seeing her smile and laugh and just being goofy with her and allowing that to happen and embracing those moments. Um, that's what I'm living for. And that's what's helping me, uh, you know, round up my sample. I love it. Some good, uh, some good producing happening over here. Some pretty good hot songs dropping out. Uh, but yeah, man, just feeling inspired by you too, Tony. And I didn't think about it until now. But yeah, my, I'm inspired by my mom too. You know, and people ask, you know, can a woman help a boy to become a man? And and I, I think, well, I don't know, but a woman can certainly help a boy to become a good human being. And that's a lot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That is a lot. That's that's at least ninety percent of it, right? And so I'm I'm grateful for the men in my life and in my community. Uh, I know he's part of this conference, uh, Pastor Alex G. Uh, seeing how he, you know, has raised his little daughter, man, and and you know she was a preemie, and you know she had this idea that she wanted to create her own clothing line called Preemies Rock. And I remember, you know, he was getting behind her and. Uh, just, you know, help to support her in developing this, this t-shirt company. And then she had a dream to go, you know, serve folks in my home country of Nicaragua. And he supported her in that. And now, you know, Lexi is, is a grown woman who's phenomenal. You know, I think about brothers like uh, Kevin Ivanko. Uh, this guy is a lifelong educator. And I would just watch him and how he interacted with his son, Roman. And, you know, Roman would have a question about something and just so skillfully, Brother Kevin wouldn't always give him the answer. He would sometimes ask him a question back so that his son could come to the answer for himself and just really own that understanding, you know, and just do it in a very uh, compassionate, patient way. I'm like, ooh, I'm going to have to sample from that. Um, you know, I think about one of my professors at UW-Madison. Uh, who's a mentor of mine, Craig Warner, uh, you know, the way that he supported his daughters and finding their passions and turning their communities into the classroom. And his daughters are phenomenal adults today. I think about the creator God, man, you know, as a man of faith, uh, that really like seriously was my father uh, during some critical points in my life. And just the way that, you know, the creator God has called me to be greater than I ever imagined to be. And, you know, trying to do that with my kids, you know what I mean? Call out that purpose, call out that passion and reflect all the beauty and brilliance that I see in them every day. Um, so with that, gentlemen, I guess we'll transition. Uh, you know, now that we have a little sense of your background, help us make sense of this whole season, man. This 2020, this season still has been lingering. It's not just 
ending with the year, but what have been at least a couple of challenges that have come up? Have there been any unexpected blessings or any insights that you've gained from this last season of crisis? I'm, I'm happy to jump in again, um, sort of get this started, especially around blessings and challenges. Um, and so, you know, I, I was, I've been in Madison since 2004 and in fall of 2019, uh, myself and Leanne and my ex-wife made a decision to move back to Waukesha County, be closer to our sport networks and sort of start fresh. Um, and in October of 2019, uh, made a decision that things weren't going well, uh, and moved in with my parents and, you know, living in Madison, commuting from Waukesha, having sort of shared placements, separated, um, that was sort of my world from October, 2019 up until really, you know, March of 2020. Um, and I realized throughout that time that there was not enough minutes, hours in a day to spend with my daughter. And then you layer on the fact that it's 50, 50, and that's just missed time altogether. And then you layer on a commute. Um, there was just never enough time. And I found myself racing home from Madison to Waukesha, trying to beat Beltline traffic, and then trying to avoid the Waukesha-Milwaukee traffic, pick up my daughter, you know, and then all of a sudden it's dinner time, bedtime. And there was like two hours. And so weekends were so important. Uh, and then the pandemic happened. And, you know, it was no longer going to work, but working remotely. And uh, I found this, uh, you know, one of the blessings is the time. And I've talked about that earlier as well. Um, and being with my daughter full time while I'm working has been a challenge, of course. But there are so many great memories. Uh, and it's reshaped the way I even think about work, even post pandemic. And the importance of work life balance um, is just going to be central to whatever I do. You know, I'm 35 years old. So whatever I do 10 years, 20 years from now, um, work life balance is going to be incredibly important. Uh, my, you know, got divorced in June of 2020. Uh, and my ex wife is a school teacher here in Waukesha. Uh, and she in Waukesha, they do things a little different. They've been in person since September. Uh, and so I've been blessed and fortunate where I've been with my daughter Monday through Friday. Rather than putting her in a daycare center or choosing to have, you know, a grandma watcher, I've made that decision that I want her full time during the day, placement evenings, weekends, the entire deal you take her, you pick up. Um, and I've cherished those times, those memories. I've learned how to figure out, uh, how to be an associate VP and manage to be a dad full time, um, navigate meetings, a lot of planning. Everything's pretty calculated. The other day, um, from wake up time to breakfast to meeting time to nap, um, and so it's just been such a blessing. And and as I mentioned, it's to totally reframed my thinking about work. And during this time in 2020 as well, um, my grandmother was living with my parents too. And so even thinking about an intergenerational household, right? My grandma was there, my parents, me, and my daughter. And that time, my grandma was 93. She passed away last year as well. But those memories that she had, she had dementia and Alzheimer's, but she would brighten up, smile when my daughter was around. So it was so many great blessings that were just sitting there in front of me. Um, and I think from a challenging standpoint, right, it's now thinking about returning to office and what that means from a lost time standpoint uh, and the not having day to day with, with my daughter. And then you layer on the fact that there's new variants that are, you know, infecting little ones um, and children are perhaps uh, a little more at risk here. Um, and so there's just a lot of stuff. I'm fully vaccinated. Be being an educator, I'm blessed and fortunate to be able to do that. But there's a lot of uncertainty around what will happen in the fall. Um, and so that's, of course, a challenge for me, uh, thinking about, you know, future um, and time lost with, with my daughter and just still being in a pandemic. And thinking about the risks that are associated with that. So a couple of blessings, a couple of challenges as well. Thank you. That's beautiful. Um, I can I'll jump in and and kind of hit on some similar points. Um, you know, for for one, and I'll, I'll begin with the blessings um, and, and insights, and you know, the good news first. 
but um definitely i think you know being home all day and and my partner being home all day um i think you know a really big blessing was being able to grow together and you know intimately not only physically but emotionally um being able to just have conversations day in and day out being around each other i know i saw a bunch of memes and a bunch of jokes saying oh like i'm gonna you know kill my partner i can't be with them all day whatever whatever but it's complete opposite for me and, and my wife we you know we're able to just get along so well and and then just cherish the, all this time that that we've had together um you know and that led to us uh, an unexpected surprise of, of having a corona baby um and you know and, and that translates to you know uh, another a blessing which is being a and tony talked about this is, is being a stay-at-home dad kind of you know being able to work from home and work remotely but also being able to be there all day for your family and um i think that's a huge blessing you know not very many parents are able to um well let alone have uh you know parental leave after having a baby but now you know on top of that i'm able to continue to work remotely and uh blessed to to live in madison where my uh my parents live but also my in-laws live so you know on the days where i don't have back-to-back -back meetings i'm able to stay with my my baby on the days that you know i have a full schedule I just drop off the baby right down the street pick her up um so really blessed to to have family nearby and and just to, to spend that time and to have that time um and, and you know speaking about some challenges i think one and very important to name here is mental health um, and I can't stress enough how serious and, and important this topic is. Um, I know folks before the pandemic struggled with this and myself, not necessarily so much. And, um, you know, I, I like to describe myself as a, as a social butterfly. I love people. I love interaction and I, I love mingling and going out and, and just being the life of the party. So take that away from the equation, you know, kind of left me crazy. You know, I have been, uh, trying to figure out how to cope with with all this time that I have and and all this alone time that I have now that my wife is back at work. Um, th that's definitely a challenge that I have, but I've, I've, I'm thankful that I have a support system that I can fall back on uh, when I'm feeling down. Um, but it, it's definitely been difficult learning through this this learning curve of, of how to survive during a pandemic. And, um, you know, I think another challenge I mean, you've heard of the freshman 15, but let me tell you about this pandemic 25. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it is no joke, you know, staying in all day, eating all day, getting carry out, you know, seven days a week. Wow, that'll do something to you. And, uh, you know, the gyms are closed down for a minute and, and you know, starting to get back. You know, home workouts is not really a thing that works for me. And, yeah, you know, finding the balance between my healthy place and, and, uh, my my splurging, it's been difficult, uh, and and Tony alluded to it. It's just the uncertainty of of what life is going to be, you know, going back post pandemic, and you know, it's just a lot of uncertainty. If of you know, folks are are scared to go to the gym, folks are scared to go, you know, continue their everyday lives. So the challenge is just uh, bringing back that that confidence and and wanting to do and be better. So I think uh, with that, I'll just pass it over to uh, to Anthony. Um, Thank you. Yeah, man. Uh, um, yeah, that, that COVID. Would you say COVID twenty five? That's a whole another subject. <laughs> um, but um, I think for me, by having older sons, um, Anthony Kim has really been because now they're out of the house. Uh, my youngest, he, you know, he's he's back home, but of course he's he's living life on his own terms at the same time. And so I think really. Um, for me, it's just just to navigate. You have to navigate life differently, right? You, you know, it's not it's not the 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 good old days. That's why, as y'all are talking about having younger ones, I'm like, wow. I remember when they were that age. I wish they were still that age from time to time. We can go to the movies all the time, or you know, the little the little small things that where you know, again fulfilling those moments that I think also I because I didn't have them, but then also 
and enjoying those moments with them. But then now I'm watching them become the men that who they are. Right. Um, and watching them grow, watching them having their own understanding of life, but still having the balance in the conversations um, by them both being in the military. I think the hardest thing, especially during COVID, was the fact of not being able to connect with them the way how we connect when we sit down. Let's go out to eat. Let's go in and really talk about whatever, whether if it's a complaint about life or it's just, you know, just enjoying life. Um and 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 being in each other's presence, I think that was the that was the thing. But when again, this is you, talking about transition. When this is a transition, when watching my sons become boys to men, also right, you, 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 you know. So that's the that's the other thing as a as a father that's trying to you know put in all the other pieces or whatever, and you kind of sit back and like, oh, wait a minute. So this is what it looks like, <laughs> right? You know, this is what it looks like, and then you start to realize the things that what um, that what you you have done well, and 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 the things that um, you hope and you hope that they continue to um, pass those things on to their kids once they have kids. You know, I'm not ready to be a grandfather right yet, but it's not my choice, right? <laughs> but um, but you know, you know, so things like that. I think um, that was really the only thing for me during the pandemic of being able um, not to be able to have that, that face-to-face -face time um, without, you know, without an iPhone, obviously, right? <laughs> right, so, um, but yeah, but we, we did what we can, um, you know, and um, I, I continue, and you'll probably hear me say a million times uh, how proud I am of them, but then also, you know, um, look forward to seeing more of the men that they will become. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing, Coop. Uh, so, yeah, we got everything from the four-month-olds all the way to the men that we're trying to father and, you know, all the pieces in between. Uh, I think very similar, man. Uh, you know, I just got the idea of the coronavirus being the DJ. You're trying to dance and, you know, you're getting every kind of beat in the world thrown at you. You're like, okay, how do I stay on beat here? This is the whole thing keeps switching up on me, you know? And uh, for me, I, I've always been someone, I, I love going to the office. I feel more productive in the office. So then it got switched up and I'm working from home and man, you know, all the kids were there and you know, I was getting shot with Nerf pellets in the middle of a webinar. I'm like, what's going on? And uh, I think, you know, for me too, I just saw like a lot more of how my wife was just holding down the fort, man, and, and how many diapers needed to be changed and how much, how many meals needed to be cooked. And, and, and I realized that I had some residue. Uh, David talked earlier about this to toxic masculinity. You know, my dad, he, he never cooked it. So I kind of had this machismo thing going on too that I, I hadn't fully detoxed from. And I realized, man, I gotta, I gotta step it up. I gotta help cook. I gotta help, you know, uh, do laundry and all this sort of thing. So I think part of the blessing and the challenge was it helped me to redefine uh, masculinity for my boys, you know what I mean? And, and to be more of an authentic partner for my, for my wife, Jennifer, uh, who like David, we're high school sweethearts, you know what I'm saying? And, and it's been a journey trying to get to the top of the Sears tower. You know, a lot of my kids in Chicago, how can you be with the girl this long? I'm like, it's like being downtown Chicago, man. You don't want to just run in and out of these buildings. You got to commit. You got, it takes a lifetime to get to the top, but, um, I guess with that too, I had a one conversation with my son because uh, I used to travel a lot nationally, was on about a hundred flights a year. And I asked my older son, Phoenix, a few months ago, I said, uh, you know, how does it, how does it feel having me around? Like, how long do you think it's been? I've been not on a flight. He said, I've, I think you've been home with us about three years. And I said, yeah, because it's been about a year since I've been on a flight. But then I had the realization that for him, it felt like three years because the previous three years was the same quality that we got in in this last year. And I realized, wow, we've packed in so much quality time in this last year. It's messed me up, man. I, I realized I got to redefine uh, success when we get back to this new normal and still trying to figure that out, to be honest with y'all. So we're going to transition here uh, to a question I'm really excited to hear your responses to, 
but it's racism. You know, do you talk to your children, your, your, your grown up sons about racism or, or racial oppression? And, you know, how do you help them make sense of these, you know, ruthless murders, man, by the hands of these police officers with yet another one happening two days ago with Dwayne Wright? Um, how do you guys do it? Um, I guess I'll jump in there real quick. So, and, and, and as much as and it pains me to even say this, is that for me and for my sons, I've been talking to them almost about this type of stuff since birth, right? You, you know, I, well, I shouldn't say since birth, but since, you know, when they were able to talk or, or, or when they started asking questions about certain things, and I, I will always kind of like put things out there on their level, right? What are some of the things that we have to watch out for? What, you know, uh, no, son, I don't want you just, you know, no, you can't go to the park with your friends by yourself, right? Or, or you know, or just kind of hang out because I know, even though I know that at some point, if a cop comes over there or or others, you, you just never know who you may end up being bunched up with. Um, Roberto, you know, my, like my son's now, Six two, almost six three, right? You, you know, so they were all, always big kids. So that was also another worry, right? You, you know what I mean? Like, okay, so I, you know, to them, it's like, oh, dad, no, we're okay, we're okay. To me, I'm like, oh, no, you know, I'm on this frantic mode and having that discussion. Like, these are the things that can happen, right? So, no, I don't want your car, your 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 um your car to have tenant windows because of this and that, you know, but in Madison, um, you know, again, originally from Chicago. So um, it's one, of, but went to high school here and things of that nature, but just notice noticing the shift. Right. So I think to me, this is my own personal belief is that where Madison, Madison's always kind of had like this bubble around it. Right. It, you know, I remember my son, this is when Tony Robinson had got shot. And my son had posted, you know, it's like my dad always said that something like this can happen in Madison. We talk about, you, 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 you know what I mean? And, and so, and, you know, and so many kids, and I hate to say it, but with Phil and just like even for some parents, like, hey, we're in this town, we're in this city, we're safe. There is no safe, especially when it comes to black and brown kids. Right. That, that's a, this is a, a totally different playing ground because you just never know what's going to happen. And us as fathers and, and you know, mothers as, as well we do our best to be able to keep our children safe by having the deep conversation, but we just, you know, we have to make sure those conversations, it's not a one, a one and done. This is something we got to talk about in life. You, you know, we have to drill that into their heads and that's a, a part of their survival kit, you know, on top of, Hey, I want you to do well in school on top of, you, you know, once you get to college, once you, you know, and so on and so forth. These are the things, these are the type of, uh, you know, a career, if you thought about this, that and, and trying to give them as much exposure as possible, but still with the safety net around them as well. So. Excellent. Um, you know, there's not really a lot I could say on this topic, just because I haven't had this conversation. I have a four month old and, but it is something that I think about, you know, my, I have a biracial child, half white, half Latina. Um, she's still going to, you know, and, and I hope it's not the case, but given the system and the times we live in, you know, just preparing her for the worst. Um, but I believe, and I, and I, and this is just with everything that I do in life is just, you know, shooting it straight. She's just going to have to be real with the kids and with my children. And in, on this topic of racism and, and oppression, there is no sh sugarcoating this topic. There is nothing that you can say to make it seem nice, to make it seem, you know, like it's not a big deal because it is. Um, you just start with history and, and, and ensure that they know, you know, where, how we've come here as a nation and, and, and understand the things that have led us to uh, where we are. And, and the fight continues. You know, this is a, something that's going to be, you know, for generations to come. And I hope that these conversations uh, that I have with my daughter and, and that my children continue to have with myself and their community, I hope that these spark in them to become change makers. Um, yes. And, and that these, in these conversations and, and these, you know, these interactions help shape a different worldview than those of past generations. Um, so and I think it, it, you know, it begins at home, having these tough, honest and real world conversations 
uh, it begins at home and, and it begins with us as fathers and, and as families uh, to have these conversations. And I, I believe it'll pay dividends in the end. That's good. Yeah, David, similar to, to your sentiments there, um, having a, a two-year-old, I'm not necessarily having this sort of conversation uh, with her yet, although I know it's down the road. Um, raising a, a Latina is going to be something where we're talking about race, ethnicity, what I do, you know, for a profession and for a living. This is obviously part of my work and part of an everyday conversation. Um, and so I, I know when you think about folks like Dr. Ibram Kendi, who does a lot of great work around anti-racism, um, he talks about the importance of beginning explicit conversations about race and racism with babies at a young age. And that babies are truly taught to be racist or anti-racist and there is no neutrality. Um, and it's our roles as parents, as fathers, um, to help shape uh, belief systems, to help, you know, expose folks to different cultures, different elements of diversity. Um, and I know living in a pandemic, it's been tough to do that. Um, it's all been, you know, about keeping your bubble and for at least me staying here. And so we're not going on play dates. We're not going to parks. We're not interacting with people who look different than my daughter or his culture is different as well. Um, and so I'm, you know, think back to the last question on challenges. I think that's going to be a challenge that some of us have as fathers is how do we go about uh, introducing race um, and some of the contemporary issues that are happening uh, when sort of, you know, this new generation is growing up um, quarantined and sort of in isolation. Um, but I, I, similar to what you said, David, whether it's three, five, 10, 20, 30 years from now, these senseless murderings, racism, racial oppression, unfortunately, is going to be front and center in our lives. And um, it's our, again, it's our job as parents, as fathers, um, to have real talk and to be honest with folks um, and to do our best with giving people advice and wise counsel um, and preparing our kids, you know, our, our seed, our legacy um, to exist in this world and to, you know, have the same opportunities that many of us have as well. Some really good insights. You know, I love the quote from uh, Ibrahim Kendi, you know, we got to teach these babies, right, how to be anti-racist early on, um, you know, and, and to do it in, in developmentally appropriate ways. And as Coop said, you know, it's, it's a lifelong conversation. You know what I mean? Um, racism, unfortunately, is this virus that, like COVID-19, is always evolving, man, right? And so we got to keep up to date with the vaccines and how we get rid of this thing. Uh, but yeah, for me personally, I got a nine-year-old, four-year-old, four-month-old, four you know, trying to have these developmentally appropriate conversations uh, with, my, with my sons and, and they love stories, you know? And so I kind of remix the stories, uh, you know, what David was alluding to with history, the stories of, of our nation um, with, you know, the brother Kevin approach of asking questions. And I'll say, well, you know, they say, well, they told us at school, Columbus, you know, sailed the ocean blue in 1492, and he discovered America. And I said, well, isn't that interesting? Because there was over 10 million people who were already living on the continent. So what do you think? Can, can you discover a place where there's 10 million people already living? And you're like, no, that doesn't make any sense at all, you know. And then I ask questions like, how does a nation that's the youngest nation in the world become one of the richest nations in the world, you know? And then we start getting into the 400 years of slavery. And that's, that's a lot for a kid to take in. But, you know, he starts asking questions and, and you start explaining like, hey, you know, they, they said the people of color, you know, weren't human beings, that we were savages, that we weren't smart enough. And, you know, talking about how this thing has evolved. Uh, we've talked about redlining. And why white communities have 10 times more wealth. You know, we've talked about white uh, police officers and, and white teachers that um, are programmed and, and brainwashed to think the people of color are criminals or not smart enough. And so like you, David, uh, my children, they're, they're multiracial. You know, I'm, I'm mestizo, man. I'm European, indigenous, African. My wife is Asian. Uh, we, we call our kids for short, you know, Hispasians, man, you know, and there's a lot of different stereotypes going on there. But 
ultimately I want them to be their authentic, multicultural, multiracial selves and, and to, you know, be part of the counter narrative. I, I love what you were saying, David, that we are growing up the next generation of change agents, man, that have the capability of changing the narrative and they need our support and our permission, you know, to do so. But I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm excited. So I guess with that, gentlemen, I want to ask the final question here. And I know we got uh, 7,000 participants here who are watching in, <laughs> but uh, let's, I'm enjoying the conversation. So what if this sickness, what if all this death, what if all this senseless racism and murder is the compost to growing stronger families, communities, and a more flourishing state? In your opinion, brothers, what broader changes in parenting or community building need to happen to create a new normal so that we can better prepare these future generations to be these change agents, to change this narrative, to be the change that we're dreaming about? Um, <clears throat> oh, oh, go ahead, David. I think you were about to go. Yeah, I can, I can, I can go. Um, you know, I, I, I just want to say, you know, having these conversations is a great place to start. As I alluded to earlier, we need to have these discussions, continue to build these relationships and, and discussions. And I want to thank Henry Sanders, Madison 365 the panelists here today and all the men, uh, women, children, everyone listening today. Uh, you know, as we continue to have these conversations, uh, as we continue to shed light on all the bad and what doesn't work, uh, we are going to find what does work. We're going to find uh, a new path forward for men of color. And we're going to, you know, offering these venues and, and these opportunities uh, that will help create and generate this conversation. It will also help build a community that we want to work, uh, you know, that will help us work cohesively in building the future that we want. Um, you know, the, uh, and on, on that same vein, uh, policy and legislation has a lot to do with the quality of our life. Uh, I applaud Madison, uh, the city of Madison, for electing the council that they did on April 6th. 12 out of the 20 alders are people of color. Uh, we need to continue electing folks that look and think like us uh, and put these people into office. Uh, for example, Representative Stubbs introduced legislation, uh, legislation to remove barriers to natural hair braiding. Um, just let that sink in for a moment. Uh, the truth is, it, it may have taken, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, a, a white legislator longer or maybe even nev never to introduce this type of legislation. Uh, but as a woman of color, she knew exactly what her community needed. We need to con uh, continue to build political power, both in our electorate and in our elected officials. Um, and in terms of parenting, I believe, uh, in my opinion, just being there for your children, you know, uh, showing up, showing them love being uh, that annoying parent that shows up to all of the, the, the events um, and just allowing our children to grow as children. Um, I believe all of this will help create a better normal moving forward. And there was a, a quote that I heard. Um, I don't know where it was, Twitter, Instagram, something like that. I don't know who it was even from, uh, but it, it made sense. It resonated. And, and it kind of um, ties into this, to this, this question of, uh, you know, our history of trauma the trauma that we're cur currently experiencing that hasn't made us stronger. We are making ourselves stronger. What we are doing today, what we plan to do in the future, what we are doing now, this is what's making us stronger. And this is what's going to create a new and better normal for us in future generations. Um, Wonderful. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Yeah. That was strong and powerful, man. I, I and I, I couldn't do anything, but that definitely just jump onto what David said. And I, and I'll probably even simplify it a little bit more. Just the fact of, you know, be the change that we want to see, but then also exposing our, our, our kids and making exposing our, our children to these conversations, but with action behind it, you, 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 right. You know what I mean? To making sure our children know each other to making sure that we are really truly being the community Right. You know what I mean? Holding each other accountable as brothers and sisters, but then also being a community that we want our kids to have. 
You know what I mean? So, you know, it is for our kids to know each other. It is for our, our uh, um, you know, our families to know each other. But then also, so it's easier to make those types of connections. So I don't care if you, you move to Timbuktu and say, oh, I, you know, we know someone there. You know, make sure you make that connection or, or, or whatever. You, you know, those things speak volumes, you, you, you know, um, for our kids. But then also showing that the research we have as, as parents, but then also knowing that they're not alone, knowing that you're not alone uh, and, 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 um, and growing the community that we want to be able to really ch- be a generational change, I feel. So mm. that. mm, mm, mm. that's good. Thank you. Just a couple of quick things to add. Um, you know, I, I think about narratives out there of fathers who are black or brown. Um, and I think we all have that important work to counter narrative that and to be our very best as men, as fathers, um, to raise our sons, daughters, um, with however they feel that they express from a gender standpoint, from a sexual orientation standpoint, from who they are. Um, it's our job as men, as fathers, to let them shape their identity and to be the wise counsel for them, but to let them figure out who the heck they are. Um, and I think it's important work. It's hard work. Uh, you know, Dwayne Wade's uh, doing some good stuff out there um, with, you know, uh, on social media and raising his kids. Um, but I think we all have a responsibility to raise the next generation. Um, and, you know, I think it also, obviously, we've all talked about this in Madison Takes Village. And so we got to have our support systems. Um, and whether it's community support systems, whether it's families, um, and as David talked about earlier, wellness, right? And so there's, there's a lot of, whether it's single dads in the Madison area, divorced dads in the Madison area, dads that are just doing good stuff. And this is one opportunity, thanks to Madison 365, for us to get together and talk about it. But I, I think it's important for us to carry this conversation forward offline as well. And for us as fathers, as men, um, to be supports to one another, uh, to mentor each other, to mentor those new dads. They don't have to make some of the same mistakes that we make. Um, And so I just think there's an important space that we can create. And this, this, this forum, this summit is incredibly important and I hope serves a catalyst for us to continue conversations offline. And that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, You know, I echo everything that you guys are saying Uh, as someone who is an educator, youth development professional, you know, I'm aware that one of the contributing factors for our youth becoming and thriving uh, as adults is they got to have relationships uh, with adults other than parents. You know what I mean? We can be these phenomenal dads, but when the kids become teenagers and cool, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but you can say something a hundred times to a kid and they're a teen that goes in one ear out the next, but then David comes in and says the same thing. And they're like, Oh man, that is so deep, yo. And you're like, dude, what do you, what is going on right now? I've been saying that. Right. And so we get to this point and we all kind of true, this all true. <laughs> even now. Right. It's like, dude, what? And so we get to this point, like we can be these phenomenal fathers and we've all seen this. But the kids, when they become adolescents, they start trying to find that that identity like Tony's talking about. You know what I mean? That's separate from their parents. And so that's when like other mentors and other fathers can have a lot of influence in helping to co-create these healthy identities, man. So, you know, it's part of the reason why we're moving back from Montreal to Madison, man, is that it truly does take a village. Like you said, Coop, you know, our families need to, need to interact and know each other, man, because you're going to be able to speak life into my kids the way that I cannot at a certain point, And I can speak life into your kids in a way that you can't. So this intersectional, this sort of um, beloved community is something that that we got to live, man. We got to stop talking about it and start being about it. And so I just want to thank you all for, uh, you know, leaning into this conversation and, and not just sharing these stories, but, you know, letting this be a catalyst, as you said, Tony, for change, right? That we can take this offline, uh, continue to build with one another and build in our community. So I want to thank you guys for sharing these stories, being vulnerable with us, uh, and and really inspiring this audience of millions who will be watching this uh, to be the change that they want to see, as you said, cool, and to let this be a change reaction that maybe could even impact 
the seventh generation from now, you know? So with that, gentlemen, it's truly been an honor. Let's continue the conversation where we're all in the same city, break some bread or some tortilla, have some coffee or a beer or whatever, and keep it going, man. Thank you so much. I don't need no bread. That's (laughs) right, that's right. right. And thank you to 365, Madison 365, uh, for putting this together and getting the word out and helping to change uh, the narrative and to share a new narrative of what is possible. So thank you, Henry, and all the folks, Stephanie, and everyone else. Y'all take care. This is 365 Media.